Well, I became a Christian in a local church, and I didn't know anything about the Bible, and I started read it, reading it, and I got seriously excited when I started reading about Jesus, but I also got seriously discouraged because I realized that I couldn't be with Jesus the way they, the, those disciples were with Jesus. I mean, they got to eat with him, they got to um, talk to him, they got to walk with him, they got to do ministry with him, and I thought, That's, I'm, I'm really glad I'm a Christian. I mean, my, my whole life was changed, but I was just like, dang, I don't get to be with Jesus like they were with Jesus. And I feel confused and I feel kind of lost and I'm not sure if I can actually hear God's voice and follow him and just really conflicted about all that. And then I started reading the rest of the Bible and I realized that I wasn't alone. That God's people throughout time have always struggled with being guided by the Holy Spirit. And it's not because they didn't want it or ask for it, but there's just a mystery with all this stuff. Well, what I want to do today is maybe to um, bring some understanding into how God speaks to us, how God speaks through us, and what that all looks like in everyday life. And we're going to look at a story in just a minute um, from Acts, the, the, early, the account of the early church, the Holy Spirit through the leaders, uh, where a group of Christians like us trying to hear God like we want to do, we're confused. And it got me thinking about how God has always worked through time. And all the way back in the Old Testament, the second book of the Bible, God had to do a, a miraculous thing to guide his people. It says in Exodus chapter 13 that the Lord went before um, them, his people, by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way and by night in a, pi a pillar of fire to give them light that they, that they may travel by day and, and by night. See what's going on, God's people are coming out of Egypt into the promised land and they don't know where they're going. They're walking in the desert. And God says, I want to guide you, I want to lead you, I want to protect you, so I'm gonna give you a cloud and when the cloud moves, you move. And if the cloud stays, you stay. Now, that'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it, if you had your own personal Holy Spirit cloud? Be awkward at work, but it'd be nice, right? Well, actually, get this, we have something better. We have something better. Jesus said it this way. He says, uh, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus could only be in one place at one time. But the, the, the miraculous thing that happens when we give our lives to Christ, here, here's the exchange. We give God our sin and our shame. He gives us forgiveness and his spirit. I'm just gonna throw this out there. That's not a bad deal. That's not a bad deal. You get the third person of the Trinity somehow, mystically, supernaturally, to take up residence in your life. Nobody's excited about it. I mean, let me say it again. You get the third person of the Trinity to set up residence in your life. That's what, it, that's what it means to be a Christian. It's a supernatural event. And so you don't need a cloud. You don't need fire. You actually have the cloud and the fire within you to guide you and to lead you. And, and what God does is then he begins to speak to you and through you. The prophet Joel foresaw this in Joel chapter two that's recorded in Acts chapter two. Here's what he says. He says, in the last days, I'm gonna pour my spirit out on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. In the New Testament, we're not promised a pillar of fire, but we are promised the gift of prophecy. And Joel is saying Everybody gets to play, not just the men, but the women. Not just the old, but the young. Not just the educated, but the common. Every Christian, because they have the Holy Spirit set up resident within them, have the ability to prophesy. Now this makes certain parts of the church quite nervous. And I used to be in this uh, kind of flow, and they call the, the, this part of the church, or this theological understanding, cessationalism, meaning the gifts, the, the gifts have ceased. Not sensational, cessational. That the gifts, the, the supernatural stuff in the Bible was just for Bible people, okay? But God has given us a Bible, and now we have our brain, and we don't need all that spooky Holy Ghost stuff, okay? 
That's called cessationism. And you gotta understand, you know, and being in this camp formally, you gotta understand they're reacting against a lot of crazy in the church. Everybody ever, any, ever seen crazy in the church? Yeah, you can go and get crazy. And uh, I, I mean, my deal is I'd rather be wrong in the circus than the cemetery, but I mean, if something gets crazy. It gets crazy and, and it, gets, it, it goes beyond what is in biblical norms. And so cessationists go, we don't, we don't like that, we don't believe that. And, and I used to be there except the problem is with this view, uh, the Bible, the Bible's the problem. Because the Bible over and over again not only says that this is a part of the Christian life, it actually commands us to pursue supernatural ministry in and through our lives. You say, where do you find that? I'm glad you asked. 1 Corinthians 14, 1. We have it on the screen here. It says, pursue love, okay? Earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may what? So, do everything in love. That's what chapter 13 is about in 1 Corinthians. And I want you to have all these gifts. But Paul says, the main thing I want you to ask for, the main thing I want you to pursue, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're young or old, no matter who you are, if you're a follower of Jesus, I want you to interact with God's spirit. I want you to ask for the gift of prophecy. I want you to pursue it. Now, prophecy is a, is a, is a multifaceted idea, okay? When I, you know, read about prophecy, a lot of times you think prophets, right? You think Old Testament prophets, guys with long beards and pronouncing judgment. Well, that's true. There were Old Testament prophets, and these Old Testament prophets many times would utter this little phrase that you can read over 200 times in the Old Testament, and the phrase goes something like this. Repeat it. If you know it, say it with me. Thus saith the Lord. They said that like 200 times, meaning this. What I'm saying is God's truth. I am speaking for God. That's Old Testament prophets. Now, what happens is we switch testaments, we switch covenants, we go from Old Testament to New Testament, and that idea, Old Testament prophets, kind of merges with what are called New Testament apostles. New Testament apostles didn't say, thus saith the Lord, and, 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 and say, now follow my words, as much as they wrote down words that we were, we were to follow. Meaning it's not what the New Testament apostles said, it's what they wrote, because they said all kinds of stuff. But an Old Testament prophet basically spoke God's words. New Testament apostles wrote down God's words. Now, let me bring the gift of prophecy, as the New Testament talks about it, into that. When we use the gift of prophecy, it is not authoritative like the Old Testament and the New Testament. The gift of prophecy is underneath God's revealed truth. It is a gift, it is from God, but it is not binding. It does not bind our consciences. Now let me tell you why I believe this. There's, there's all kinds of ways to define the gift of prophecy in the New Testament. I think Wayne Grudem, who's a theologian, says it best. Here's what he says the gift of prophecy is. He says it's when we speak merely human words to report something that God has said. Human words, okay? So it's not God's words, like thus saith the Lord. It's not Bible, it's human words responding to something that God has impressed on upon, upon us, uh, you know, uh, prompted us with, given us a dream or something like that. And so when you think about the gift of prophecy, you have to think about it as human words trying to, uh, trying to make sense of something that God has revealed in the spirit. And I know when we talked about the gift of prophecy, we're dealing with all kinds of myths that come with it. Things that we believe about it that influence how we see it. And by the way, that's always the case with the scripture. We come in, you never look at the scripture unbiased. You always bring in your own categories. And so let me explode some myths that might keep you from understanding the gift of prophecy. One of those is this, that it can only be done by prophets. Meaning like if you're gonna prophesy, you have to car have a card, a business card that says, I'm Joe the prophet. No, you don't. You don't. Joel said, everybody gets to prophesy. prophesy. Like y'all get to prophesy. All y'all get to prophesy. That's what Joel's saying. Everybody gets to play. All right, it's, it's only been done by prophets, that's a myth. Another myth is it's mainly foretelling. In other words, 
It is a gift that tells people about the future. Actually, what we see in the scripture is it's mainly about a gift that helps people in the present, not really about the future, although future is a part of it. Another myth is that it is equivalent to preaching. In other words, prophecy equals preaching. And this is what our cessationist friends, this is what they have to do to maintain their theology. But that's, that's poor um, interpretation because the word for preach is a different word than the word for prophesy. The word for preach means to proclaim, to announce. The word for prophesy means to speak forth because of a revelation. And let me tell you the easiest way to understand the difference between preaching and teaching and prophecy. What I'm doing right now is teaching or preaching. Now, I know I try to make it, and, and Pastor Josh and, 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 and all, all of us that teach up here do the same thing. We try to make it seem like we're not prepared. In other words, we want to make it feel like, hey, we, 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 this is some thoughts we have we're going to share with you. We've done the work, though. There's been a lot of hours into this sermon. That's teaching. That's preaching. Prophecy is not planned. It's spontaneous. See the difference? So you prepare to teach, you prepare to preach, you don't prepare to prophesy, you don't think, okay, God, how are we gonna do this thing, right? No, it's a, it's a revelation, it's, it's something that comes up. Another, and the last myth is this, it shouldn't be questioned. It shouldn't be questioned. In other words, the myth is this, if somebody comes to me and says, God said this for you, or however they say it, I feel like God, the myth is I should listen to that and accept it without challenging it at all or thinking through it. That's not true. Also not true is you should not assume if God speaks to you subjectively through a, through a vision, through a dream, through an experience, you, you should not assume that that is also pure and totally from God. You should always check that. You say, well, that, where do you get that? That's 1 Thessalonians chapter five. Paul's talking about the gift of prophecy. Here's what he says. Do not quench the spirit and do not despise, prof uh, despise prophetic utterances or prophecies. Now, why would he write those two things? Because what is the church tempted to do? Quench the spirit, right? We're tempted to go, ah, we got this, God. Don't, don't mess with our deal. We got, we got it. Don't, we don't want to invite the Holy Spirit because he'll kind of mess up the program and we'll go over. And, you know. Now, don't do that, but also don't despise prophecies. And you don't understand this last one until you've been in a real charismatic church or a charismatic conference. I was just in a conference last weekend. You go to a conference or a church where people really believe in the gift of prophecy, you will get four prophecies on the way to the bathroom. <laughs> and three of them will contradict each other. That's why he has to say, don't despise this, because they're easily despicable. Why? Because they're merely human words, and sometimes we don't get it right. So Paul says, when somebody prophesies, or you feel like the Lord is saying to you something outside of Scripture, what do you do? Test. Test everything. What do you test it against? You test it against what is true and objective and finished. Now, so what does that mean to test it? Well, some hold fast at what is good. Sometimes what you feel what God has revealed to you is good. And then there's stuff that's not so good. Could be even evil. He goes to an extreme. So what that means is when God speaks to you or God's speaking through you or God's speaking to you from somebody, you test it. Part of what they are, are saying is, might be true, part of it might not be true. All of it might be true, or none of it might be true. You have to test it against God's word, which presupposes something, doesn't it? That you actually know God's word. So here's, here's where this goes. You obey scripture, you test prophecy. And that is exactly what Paul has to do in our text. He is going to show us here in Acts chapter 21 how you do this. So let's begin reading in verse eight, Acts chapter 21, verse eight. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt 
and bound his own hands and feet and said, thus saith the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns the belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? You're weeping and breaking my heart. For I'm ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. And after these days, we got ready and we went up to Jerusalem. Now, this passage tells us what to do when we feel like God is speaking to us or God is speaking through us or somebody is speaking from God to us. How do you do it? How do you, well, you have to understand the three dynamics that are always at place when the gift of prophecy is being exercised. The first one is actually what the, what the, the definition of the gift of prophecy. There's a revelation that happens. There's a revelation that happens. And the revela- this answers the question, what did God say? What are the merely human words that somebody put onto what God has actually revealed? Now, in that text, I know we read it fast, what is the revelation? The revelation is, Paul, you're going to be persecuted. That's the what. Now, every time you have a revelation, then you go to the second uh, stage, which is interpretation. What does it mean? What does it mean? God has revealed this. Now, what does it mean? Well, the way they interpreted it as it seems like Paul's going to die, which is why they don't want him to go, right? So God has said Paul's going to be persecuted. They interpret it as Paul's going to die, so don't go. Well, then Paul's like, wait a minute, right? And he gives an application because it kind of involves him. And he said, an application answers the question, what should I do? And, and they say, well, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. That's their application. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to die, so don't go to Jerusalem. Paul says, uh, I'm going to be persecuted. I might die. I'm going to Jerusalem. Same word, different interpretations, different applications. Can you see how this might get a little messy in the church. This is why when Paul writes a whole letter to, to, the, to the church at Corinth and he addresses this issue in two, two full chapters trying to sort all this out. Because when this thing is flowing, it gets super messy. Which is why cessationists go, no thank you. Sounds too crazy. Now, let me remind you who missed it. Because they misinterpreted it. They misapplied it. Let me remind you who did that. Philip. Philip was one of the, what, what they call deacons, first deacons in the Bible. The church was growing and exploding, and people were falling through the cracks. Where, and I just want to encourage those of you, some of you have fallen through the cracks here at Seacoast. And, and, and you go, well, something must be wrong. No, probably something must be really right. Because what happens is when a church is growing and, and, and in number People fall through the cracks, and it doesn't mean that it's good that you fall through the cracks. It means that it's normal. Church needs to respond to that. Church did. Acts chapter 6, we need deacons. Philip was one of those. He also was an evangelist. He also did signs and wonders. God did miracles through him. He was the one that led to the first church that got planted in Ethiopia. Philip missed it. Another person that was there, Luke. Heard of him? I don't mean Skywalker. You heard him? Luke, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. That's why in the, in the text in chapter 1, it's going, we, we, we. Why? Because Luke's writing it. He's with them. Luke, Luke missed it. Philip had four daughters who had the gift of prophecy, and, and they, were, they were using it, and so people recognized it. They missed it. I don't know who else was there. They missed it. Paul's like, no, I've already been told. God has made it very clear to me. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to struggle. It is not a reason to avoid going to Jerusalem just because I might die. Now, I'll give you a, 
an example of these three things, revelation, interpretation, application. My daughter's going to a Christian college. And uh, anybody go to a Christian college or, a, you know, the, the, do that? Here's the deal with Christian colleges. They're very interesting. I went to one. Um, usually, there's a, there's a, there's a, a ratio kind of uh, interesting thing that happens at Christian colleges. There's, there's usually three to four guy, girls for every guy. I don't know how that works. But, and, uh, and, and some would say girls are there for a, a, a special degree that happens a lot in Christian colleges, it's called the MRS degree. And so you have a lot of ladies there who are looking, and that's just true. I, I was in it, my wife and I got married when we were in college, so I'm one of those statistics. And so let's say you're a Christian guy in the conference and, and you're at the football game that I went to at my daughter's college, and this, the, on, the, on the big you know, um, flat screen, huge for the football stadium, there comes an ad on before the game. And the ad is from a jewelry company. And they give their little spiel, and all of a sudden then, uh, in, in bright yellow uh, letters, it says, a ring by spring. That's what it says. And I thought, man, they're not even hiding it here, man. It's just like out there, wow. A ring by spring. And let's say this dude was watching that while he was sitting in the stands watching the football game, and he had thought that God had called him to singleness and he was gonna be a bachelor to the rapture. And then all of a sudden, he sees that billboard with those bright yellow letters, a ring by spring, and he feels in his heart that God wants him to get married and that he's not gonna be single. And he kinda has an emotional moment. And then he, that's the revelation. Then what does he do then? Interpretation. So. He, he begins to think on that, and he's like, wait, the billboard said a ring by spring. So I need a ring by spring. That's three months from now. Well, if I'm going to get a ring by spring, I need to find a girl. So now we go to the application. So he's walking out of the football stadium, and he starts making eye contact with every girl that he sees. And the first girl that does not look down because this creepy guy keeps staring at everybody, he gets on his knee, and he proposes. Now, this didn't happen. Actually, it probably did happen. Actually, we just don't know about it in a, in a Christian college. It probably did happen, something like that. But see how we can mess up what God has revealed? God probably spoke to that guy. It's hypothetical. Hey, man, it's okay to get married. Maybe his parents were divorced. Maybe he had an image of marriage that was wrong, and God just really had a moment there. But it's so easy to take what God has said, right, misinterpret it, and misapply it. Now, I don't know if that discourages you or encourages you. It's a little of both, isn't it? It's encouraging to think that, that we are, I don't know if you're in this bunch or not, man, but I just feel like, God, could you just be a little bit more clear? I mean, just a little more. But then you look, and the Bible people had the same problem. I mean, Luke, Philip, even Paul in Acts chapter 16, he can't figure it out. He thinks he's supposed, he comes from basically um, the east and he's supposed, he starts walking north and then he goes south and then he's like, well, where else is there to go? West? And it's just like everybody's in the same boat. So it's a little bit encouraging, but it's also discouraging. If Bible people can't get it right, how in the world am I going to hear God? Well, they heard God. And God spoke to them despite their anxiety, despite their insecurity, despite their stumbling. He still spoke to them. But I think it says something to us about how God guides. And let me give you a few pr principles about that. Sometimes God, a lack of God's guidance is actually his mercy to us. It's merciful. It's merciful. Think about Paul. You're just standing there doing ministry. Some weird guy that he had not met, it seems like from the text, comes, rips the belt off of his waist, and then lays on the ground and somehow ties his own hands and feet together. That's a weird day, right? And then he starts talking. Hey, the guy that owns this belt, and Paul's like, you know who you took the belt off of? I'm that guy. The guy that owns this belt is going to, why did Paul need to hear that? 
Why did Paul need that kind of clarity? He didn't always get that kind of clarity. He needed to hear it because of the difficulty of the task. A lot of times, the clearer God is, the more pain that is involved. Because you need to be able to know in the middle of the struggle, in the middle of the suffering, and in the middle of the pain, you need to be able to look back and go, but God said. But God said. You, and so some of us are like, God, will you just be really clear? Be careful what you're asking for. The father was really clear with the son. You're going to go to the cross. You're going to die for the sins of of the world, and yet in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before Jesus died, Jesus is there talking to his father, and he says, if there's any other way, right? Because a lot of times, clarity is accompanied by pain. So sometimes, it's best that we don't know. I mean, those of you who've been married for a while, aren't you glad that you didn't know how hard it was gonna be? You go, I don't know if I would've, Done that deal, right? If I'd have known. But God sometimes conceals instead of reveals. And it's for our good and it's about his mercy. Uh, another, another principle is this. God's guidance requires us to give up control. I, I don't know this for a fact, but as I read the book of Acts and as I kind of observe Paul, I think he was kind of a control freak. Just the way he writes, the way he interacts, the way he would just like cut people off who would mess with his deals. Like, he, you know, anybody else maybe, maybe just, I mean, I don't know, just hypothetically could be a control freak, just possibly want to raise your hand. Mass confession is good for the soul. Raise your hand. Yes, I see those hands. Yeah. So when you're a control freak, you're going to have a hard time being guided by God because you're wanting to know every detail and every little thing. And God's just like, no, you don't get to know. You don't, you, don't get to choose. you don't get to put me in a box. You don't get to quarantine me, God says. I'm going to take over. I'm not coming to just show up. I'm coming to take over, which means we don't get to be in control. Uh, I like to give God deadlines. You ever do that? How's that going for you? Not well. Yeah, me either. You're the sovereign king of the universe, the Lord of heaven and earth. You have till Friday. <laughs> if you won't release control to God, you won't discern the guidance of God. God's guidance starts with trusting God now. Like now, now. Like right now. Now. We want to trust God for the future. It's, it's easier to trust God for the future than to trust God in the present. It's easier to look out and, and go, oh, God, you're going to take care of this and this and this, and I know you're going to work all that to good, but it's hard to go, but you're doing that right now. There's a verse in Proverbs that I really misapplied. Uh, it's Proverbs 16, 5, and it says, commit your, I mean, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Now, I read that like this. Commit your plans to the Lord, and your deeds will succeed, essentially. In other words, um, God, here's my plan, now bless it. I forgot who said it, some author said, if you wanna make God laugh, give him your plans. Here's my plan, now I need you to bless it for me. Will you please, Lord? Versus what the verse is actually saying, Commit your plan. In other words, tr the word means to trust, to lean the weight of your life on, to surrender control to. Do that with your plans. In other words, do that with the outcomes and then trust him to bring the process and make it clear. We want to trust God. We want, we want to commit our way to God as long as he, we get our way from God. In other words, I'll trust you if I know what you're doing. I will trust you if I can make sense of how you're going to answer my prayer. And let me tell you something, and I hate this, but it's true. God is absolutely committed to making us dependent on him. 
He's absolutely, you want to know what's God doing in my life? He's absolutely committed to making you totally, utterly, completely dependent on him, which means we give up control. He will not answer prayers that allow us to be more independent of him, which if you audit your prayer life, you will find that's a lot of our prayers. We pray a lot so that we don't need God. And God said, no, I gave you prayer so that you would realize you need me. Elizabeth Elliot, one of my favorite authors, whose husband died bringing the gospel to a remote tribe that led to really thousands and thousands of people giving their lives to Jesus and missions. And and she was a great writer in in and of herself after her husband died. She writes about this in, in, in a work called God's Guidance, A Slow and Certain Light. Here's what she says. She says, the more we have to pay for advice, the more likely we are to listen to it. Advice from a friend, which is free, we may take or leave. Advice we've paid a consultant for, we're more likely to accept. But still, it's our choice. We can take it or leave it. But the guidance of God is different, she says. First of all, we do not come to God asking for advice. We come asking for his will, which is not optional. And God's fee is the highest of all. It costs us everything. To ask for the guidance of God requires abandonment. We cannot say to God, if I were to trust you, you must give me such and such. Instead, we must say, I trust you. Give me or withhold from me whatever you choose. And then she quotes, John Newton, who wrote the the hymn Amazing Grace, she says, what you will, when you will, how you will. What you will, when you will, what does that mean? God, whatever you want, I trust you with what? I trust you with the answer, I trust you with the outcome, and when you will, I trust you with the timing and the process, and then, I'm sorry, and then how you will is the process. So I trust what you're gonna say, I trust what you're gonna do, I trust when you're gonna do it, and I trust how you're gonna do it. That's what it means to have the guidance of God. And I think about it this way. If you're ever sailing, right, and I'm not like an expert sailor or anything like that, but I was just thinking about the idea of raising the sails. Like like when you're sailing, you can have the boat ready, you can have the best equipment, and then you can raise the sails, but what are you utterly, totally, what, what are you dependent upon when you're sailing? The wind. Interesting. The Hebrew word for spirit is the word ruach. It means breath, wind. In Genesis 1, the spirit of God is hovering over the waters right? It's breath. It's wind. Jesus says in John 3, the wind blows wherever it wants to blow. So we can't control the wind. We can't control the Holy Spirit. But we can raise our sails. And we can be sensitive. And he has promised to lead us. But it is on us to pursue supernatural relationship with him. You cannot just expect God to do stuff if you're not pursuing him and pursuing a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So that's, all, that's our opportunity, friends. I don't know, man. I, I don't think we signed up as a Christian. I, I mean, I, maybe you did. I did. I didn't sign up as a Christian to get a new moral code so that I could just like live morally. I didn't sign up as a Christian only just to have some new friends. When I read about Jesus and I read how he worked in his people and I saw how they interacted with him and I saw supernatural things happening left and right, not always the the big stuff. When I saw all of that, I thought, I want on that team. I want that. Not just the big extraordinary, but the small. A lot of times, little obediences. Inviting God and, and being guided by God in little things qualifies us for bigger things. So, 
Let's raise the sails. And let's pray for the wind. Let's pray. Father, I ask by your spirit that you would help us to hear you. We, we want to pursue this gift of prophecy. And we, it sounds kind of weird to say that, Lord, but you told us to, that we would pursue supernatural ministry, supernatural activity in our life and through our life. And that's what the church is. It's a prophetic people. And the cool thing is, God, you can speak to an eight-year-old. You can speak through an eight-year-old. And you can speak through our spouse. And you can speak through our friend. And God, you can speak to us. Some of us, I just know, we just really believe God, God would never want to speak through me. Can I just say, in the name of Jesus, that is a lie. That is a lie. He loves you. He's forgiven you. He's giving given you his spirit and he will speak to you and he will speak through you. So Lord, we put the sails up. We pray that you would speak and guide and show us not just what we want and not just what we need to do, but show us what you're doing in this earth and help us to be a prophetic people. In Jesus' name, amen.